Hi everyone, thank you all for joining us today. I'm Elaine Christian with the City of West Palm Beach Office of Sustainability, and we are so excited to be partnering with Upcycle today to chat about bike safety and the rules of the road. We have Juan with us today, and I can't wait to learn more about how to stay safe while we're all out biking. If you have any questions during the presentation, please drop them in the chat box and we will have Q&A at the end. Keep in mind that if you like today's program, we have many more scheduled. You can always visit wpv.org slash green to view our upcoming programs. I will also be sending out a follow-up email after today's presentation, which will include the recording of this presentation just in case you'd like to share it or watch it again. And it will also include any important links and resources mentioned today, um, which will also include our web pages as well. And now let's transition to Juan so we can find out more about the rules of the road. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Elaine, for this presentation, allowing me to spread the, uh, the joy of cycling around our city. Um, I am the owner of Upcycle, and we are a uh, guided tour and bicycle rental company that goes uh, around downtown West Palm Beach and into Palm Beach. And we discuss uh, the history of West Palm Beach on bicycles, of course. Um, let me share. Let's see here. No. I had this before. There you go. All right. Can you share? Can you see my screen? That looks perfect. Okay. Very good. So, welcome to the uh, rules of the road and bike safety. Uh, we're going to go through the presentation and then just if you have any questions, uh, you can type them up or uh, we do have some questions from beforehand. So as users of the road, we tend to always um, say, well, there's traffic out there, but let us reframe that and phrase it into we are the traffic. It doesn't matter if you're on a car or on a bicycle. Uh, we are part of the traffic. So you can also be part of the solution. I always say um, cars and bicycles and now scooters are on the road and we all have the same rights as well as the same loss. Um, with that in mind, you know, like same laws means the pedestrians always has the right of way. Most of us in, in every uh, intersection, the pedestrian always has the right of way. Um, but before we even get on the bicycle, let us discuss the uh, safety on our bicycles. So what tends to happen is, can I, one second here. Let me just up, right. So you want to, first of all, it's our responsibility to maintain our bicycle safety. Uh, just like any vehicle, you do your oil change, you take, check your tire pressure. If you need tires, you replace them. Same thing with the bicycle, right? Uh, the bicycle is, there's the ABCs of the bike, which is uh, air, you check your pressure tires. Um, most of the times, you know, because we ride it once in a while or once a week, or depending on how many times you ride it, you still need to inflate the tires. Uh, if I go out every day, I actually check the tire pressure all the time. And the um, air pressure is gonna be on the side wall of your tire. So you always wanna make sure that you know what pressure you're on. Uh, road bikes, you know, like these, these big back road bikes over here, they have um, about a hundred PSI. So a lot of people say, wow, it's a hundred, so it's a lot. But then this mountain bike over here has about a 40, even sometimes even 30 PSI. And most beach cruisers has 35 PSI. So you always wanna make sure you know what your air pressure is, as well as you always make sure that you have your proper air pressure on your tires. That's gonna be two things. It's gonna be uh, safer because the, ride is the bicycle is designed for each tire pressure and each tire pressure has its purpose. Higher pressure means faster, lower pressure means nice and cushy, right? Uh, same thing with the brakes. Most of the times you don't wanna find out that your brakes don't work when you have to stop for a red light. <laughs> um, so you always wanna make sure you hit the little brakes. 
and just make sure that they're they're okay. Um, as well as your brake pads. Once a year, you should always take your bike uh, for like a tune-up. What they do is they they check the brakes, but they also check on wear on the pads, uh, as if you need any wear uh, tires as well. So it's like the safety inspection, just like your car, right? You go over to the dealership, they give you a big huge list of what you need to be done. <laughs> well, same thing with the bike. Um, you know, tires most of the times wear out. The chain wears out, believe it or not. Um, you know, metal on metal, it's gonna wear out, right? And uh, that's the C for. So the chain's gonna be, I mean, sometimes it's not even in gear or making all these clicking noise. So you just wanna make sure that that's safe. Uh, so first thing is the bicycle. Next thing is you, right? You want to be safe uh, as safely as possible, right? You got, you guys can see my little outfit today is very festive. So I'm gonna be attracting a lot of attention <laughs> if I'm on a bicycle, right? Uh, same thing if you have like a, a reflective vest or a neon vest or just a bright color white shirt, black is never a good idea. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Black or dark clothing on the road is not the best as a cyclist. Now, you always want, and we'll talk about this later on, it is the um, always ride defensively. And defensively always starts with just a shirt, you know, something bright, white, yellow, red. Um, those are colors that are very visible. But as along with the clothing, uh, you have gloves, glasses, um, you have a bell. You always want to wear a bell. And then you get into your safety gear. So you have helmet, and we'll go over how to properly adjust this real quick. And you have lights, right? So light, light and bright <laughs> and turn it off now lights are very key it's not only safe but it's actually the law if you're riding at night and you don't have a light a police officer can pull you over um, most of the time they don't give you a ticket they'll give you a warning uh, but if you're you know a couple of times they'll see you and say okay we need to give you a ticket um, they can do that. A bell is always a great idea because most of the times, yes, I don't feel safe riding on the road. Let me ride on the sidewalk. There's always going to be a pedestrian there. So you want to just give them a heads up, you know, like I'm, I'm coming your way, like a little courtesy bell so you don't give them a heart attack. Um, water, locks, it's a, you know, basic, always be riding with your driver's license. You should always have your driver's license at all times. Um, so let me go over the, the bicycle laws. These are just like the key important laws. Of course, there's going to be a lot more laws, but I don't want to have, you know, go into a couple hours of just legalities here. Um, so the bicycle is legally defined as a uh, vehicle on the road. So as any vehicle, you, we always have to obey the same laws. Um, so bicycles have to obey the same traffic laws as the drivers of other vehicles. You know, if we see a red light, we stop. If we see a green light, we go. Um, stop four-way stop sign, always wanna stop. You always wanna be as courteous to other users of the, of the road, as well as to pedestrians. Uh, the bicycle is required to stop at red lights, follow the flow of the traffic, and use lights at night and uh, I'm not sure what that was. The when when I say the follow the flow of traffic, we're gonna always go with this. Um, when you there's a misconception when you run, you always want to run against the flow of traffic. And this there's a few things because of that, right? You're you're running. And you can have a feet, a foot, and you can actually maneuver yourself away from danger faster. On the bicycle, though, it's the opposite. You don't want to go against the flow of traffic, even if you're not in the bike lane. So in the bike lane or on the sidewalk, you always want to go with the flow of the vehicle, 
of traffic. <clears throat> you know, there's a few reasons for that is when you are on the sidewalk, which most of the times is more dangerous than being on the road, when it's the car stops or at a stop sign or at a driveway trying to make a right out of the driveway, they don't tend to look to the right. They tend to look to the left. So if you're going with the flow of traffic, they might see you. If they see you, they're courteous enough, they might stop or at least give you the right of way after they stop. And as well as you always know that they're gonna see you. You always wanna make like an eye contact. If you're traveling on the sidewalk, same thing. They're not gonna continue going. We're gonna go on to this a little bit later and you know, cause a collision. So always with the flow of traffic, that's very, very key, very important. So I want to actually get into um, the common collisions caused by um, cyclists. Let me see here. I can't, give me one second here. I'm gonna move this. Common collisions caused by cyclic error and a safe, a savvy, I'm supposed to be a savvy cyclist, can actually avoid. Um, so we're going to go into riding your bicycle on the bike lane. Most of the times you'll have a parked car on the right, as you can see here. You always have to be cautious that that door can swing by at any moment. If it does swing, do you have enough clearance in the back to actually avoid the door and not and avoid the car that's coming behind you? So you always want to be um, cautious that that a door can swing, a car can come. Uh, but if we have that in mind, and this is where cycling defensively comes in play. Now it doesn't matter who's right or who's wrong. The the car weighs about 6,000 pounds. I weigh 155 pounds. So I will lose. It does not matter if the car is in the wrong and I'm in the right, you always want to ride defensively. So if we have these ideas in mind, uh, the door can swing, the car is coming, how fast is the car, a door is you know, gonna swing, you wanna yell out saying, hey, I'm here. If, if you have these, uh, these um, scenarios already played out, you can avoid them. So you always wanna have that in mind. Door can open, car can be coming. <clears throat> and there's also obstruction swerves. So there's something on the road. There could be palm trees, a puddle of water, dirt, a pothole. Now, you always want to ride defensively again. So you always wanna make sure before you get into the, uh, the vehicle lane, you wanna make sure that it's safe to go into the vehicle lane. So you always wanna look back, right? You always wanna look back and make sure that the, the uh, when you swerve around obstacles, that you don't swerve into a vehicle. Um, if, if you have that idea in mind, defensively you already know, you slow down or maybe you have enough time. Then you just take the obstacle by swerving around it. Um, so this is where riding on sidewalks can be very tricky. Most of the times, um, you know, I see this around where a cyclist doesn't feel safe to be riding on the road and there's a bike lane or bike path or a sidewalk. Uh, off to the to, to the edge. You can do that and it's perfectly fine, it's legal to do. You can ride on any sidewalk, any uh, pathway as a cyclist, um, but you always wanna keep in mind that if you don't make eye contact with the driver, they don't see you. Most of the times, uh, a lot of the collisions is the driver saying, I did not see the cyclist. He came from nowhere. It just appeared. He was going too fast and just popped up. <laughs> so always when you come through an intersection, this is right here, you've got 
about two or three intersection collisions that we can come up with. Um, the guy on the purple, he's riding against the flow of traffic. So the blue car is not looking to see him on the right. He's just looking for see for cars on the left. Um, the red, the blue cyclist and the green car can collide because the green car is, doesn't know how fast the blue cyclist is going. And the blue cyclist, if he doesn't make eye contact, make sure who's gonna, that I have the right of way, you know, like the cyclist does have the right of way, he can actually just swerve and hit the blue cyclist, making that right turn, right? And then that being said, even the orange car can hit the blue cyclist. And we're gonna go into this, how the, there's a screening, there's a shadow screen screening the blue cyclist. Then we're gonna go over that in a few. Now I wanna actually discuss um, common errors, or common collision caused by motorist errors, but avoidable by a savvy cyclist. So this is where riding defensively actually plays a big role, right? Um, most of the time when you're riding, a motorist doesn't know how fast you are actually going. They can't calculate the speed because in their mind, they think that you're just a pedestrian. So you're just pretty much like standing still to them, to their view of vision, right? So what tends to happen is they say, I can still pass it the cyclist and make a right turn. Well, for one thing, that's wrong. <laughs> Cyclists tend to be going faster than expected. And when you're going in the bike lane, that motorist is gonna try to speed up and then make that right turn. So you as a savvy cyclist can slow down or try to make eye contact and then just try to signal that you're gonna go straight that you're not gonna make that right. So as long as we know that this could happen, we always have to be looking out for it, right? Same thing with, with this, this is a red st uh, stop sign in the four-way stop, right? I'm sorry, a two-way stop. The cyclist has the right of way, but what tends to happen is defensively, you're always supposed to make eye contact with the driver. Make sure that he sees you, you're here, you have that bright orange, got your helmet on, got your lights on. They don't know how fast you're going or they, they always think that they can go and then you're safe. Um, if you just say why, uh, wave hi, just to make sure that they recognize that you are there, you'll be able to avoid a serious collision on this. Um, so you always wanna keep that in mind, right? make eye contact. So this is where the moving screen comes in play. <clears throat> and this I see a lot, it's, it's happened to me a lot actually, um, where for some reason, the timing of the, of the passing, the green car is just going forward, but he creates a shadow or a screen effect. So there's no cars behind the green, the orange car is gonna make a left, but he doesn't know that there's a cyclist back there because he can't see you. The, the cyclist, most of the times we're hidden behind a vehicle and the orange car thinks, well, in his idea, he knows that there is no other cars there. So once that car passes, he's gonna try to make that left turn. But because you know that that can happen, you always wanna be ready to break. Right, so you, you want to hit your brakes a little bit, slow down, or speed up faster. But you want to try to always avoid the the same pathway that the orange car is going to make. The other key key feature is make eye contact. Um, if the car, green car passes, you keep looking at the orange driver. They're usually going to take a look at you. Um, but again, this defensive driving, right? defensive cycling. These are just collision points that we can avoid if we're just savvy. So I just actually just wanted to run those things. I did skip by the, um, the fitting of a helmet on the safety tips. 
So I actually wanted to discuss this. So when you're biking, you always want to be wearing a helmet, right? And there's a three, one, or I'm sorry, a two, one rule. So there's two fingers on top of your forehead. And most of the times you'll be able to see the tip. If you're looking, you see the tip of your helmet. And then that's safely there. There's usually a um, little ratchet back here. I don't know if you can hear it. Make sure it's snug. Without even having the straps on, the helmet should feel like it's secure in place without even having the straps. So that feels secure. If you're not, you just tighten it up a little bit more and then you do your straps. And you want about two inches, two, two fingers down here, right? Where it's comfortable enough. You don't want to cover your, your um, oh my gosh, I forgot the word. <laughs> and also, I want to discuss this. This isn't, wasn't in the slide. Headphones. Uh, it is illegal for you to drive, ride your bicycle with a headset on. Um, not to say that we don't do it. If you do do it, low volume, you can put your left ear back. You don't want that. And just put your right ear on. Now, you want that so that you can still hear cars coming. Uh, it, it is also illegal to wear headphones or like big, huge headphones um, on a motorcycle. You don't want to do that because what tends to happen is you don't hear your surroundings. So you want to just be sure that you know that there's a car coming. If there's somebody yelling, hey, like watch out or something up ahead or just want to be in tune of your surroundings. Uh, vehicles, we already went through scenarios, um, but also you know, other instances that we just don't even, can't even think of, right? Um, does anybody have a question? There was a few questions before. Yes, we do have a few questions. So I will ask you this now. And since we're talking about helmets, is the helmet required? So if you are 16 or younger, it is required by law. Uh, so if you're 16 and, and younger, now what I do like, and hopefully we'll work with the uh, West Palm Beach Police Department, is going around uh, elementary schools and not giving them a ticket. I mean, you can't give a, a kid a ticket, right? Like <laughs> put them under <laughs> under jail. But what they do have, what they do have been doing in the past is giving them ice creams. So if you have a helmet on and you're riding your bicycle to a school, uh, the officer will give an ice cream to the, to the students, to the kid, which I, I believe that's like an encouragement uh, that would play out really well in the future. So we're working with uh, the West Palm Beach Police Department to do that in some elementary schools. Um, you know, it's so easy to do, right? <laughs> yeah, and but if you're I, above I... 16, you don't have to. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a good idea. Right. I think if you have access to a helmet, it's, it's always a good idea to wear that helmet. Um, and also I just wanted to mention when, before the pandemic, we did have bike to school days and I used to participate with those at the elementary schools. And we actually had helmet fittings, um, where we would give away free helmets to the students. So I'm hoping that Eventually, we will be able to bring those back, um, but those are really fun. Um, we do have a few other questions. Um, is it legal to have red and blue bike lights? No, it is definitely illegal. Okay. <laughs> so red and blue is for police departments only, and those lights are sold to the police only. If you do have a red and blue light combined, like so it's say this is white, this is blue, right? Uh, you're signaling that you are an officer. Uh, so you're, you're, you can actually be pulled over by a cop. <laughs> uh, it is illegal. Now, I see this a lot. Um, a lot of people say, well, red is warning. So let me put it on my front. What tends to happen is you will never see a car 
having a red front light. And that is because if you see red, you think that it's the, they're leaving, they're, they're going away from you because the red is for the back. Front is always white. And then the back is always red. Never put a red light in the front or vice versa. Never put a, a white light in the back. Good tip. So do you recommend having the lights on even during the day? So these, these lights are just safety lights. Um, there are daytime running lights, which are brighter. I don't have mine here yet, but if you have 1000 lumens or above, you should put them on, uh, especially in the back. The back is always, there's a, always this uh, safety mode. This you can't really see during the day, but if you have a bright red light and a bright front light, uh, you want to put that uh, even, even during the daytime. So cars are now by law required to do daytime running lights. Um, so I feel like it should be key to also incline bicycles to have those. Now lights are expensive. So you always wanna see you know, what your budget is. Uh, these are provided by actually the, uh, the TPA, the city has some of those few of them as well. And then the police department has been giving them out to people at night that they'd see that they don't have it. Uh, most of the times, a lot of people don't know. So that's why these classes are beneficial for not only just the cyclists, us that you know are vulnerable, um, but as well the public. You know, so we can all just educate everybody a little bit more. Yeah, of course. Can you elaborate a little bit? We've had a few questions about group rides and rules for group rides. Yeah. So I, I feel like that question is gearing towards these big, huge, massive Pelotons, they call them, right? Um, the Pelotons, it's, it's, it's another topic of discussion. Um, but if you're in a group of about six people, um, if you're on the bike, if you're on the travel lane, um, because most of the times we don't have bike lanes here, we just have travel lanes. Um, you're supposed to be two abreast, so that means one cyclist to the right, one cyclist to the left, and then that's that's the limit, uh, right? And then some areas they say single file, so you just go behind one by one, with about one foot between each cyclist. Now, if you go on A1A, that rule is most of the time is not followed. Uh, I do bike with the pelotons, you know, big, huge, fifty or more people. It's, it's a different scenario once you're inside a group of cyclists. Um, what tends to happen is, you know, you got your two abreast, but then I'm getting tired in the front, so I have to pull back. Well, now there's somebody else that has to come around and then just, you know, and then that happens all the time, you know, because you can't be in the front going, most of the times there'll be traveling, not me, <laughs> 28 plus, I don't know, 25 miles per hour. So 20, even at 22 miles per hour, being at the front of the group, uh, you're, you know, exceeding more of the resistance of the wind. Um, and then that guy just gets tired. So going around, there's, there's this dynamic of group etiquette, uh, etiquette on group pelotons. So it's very hard. You know, I, I see it both ways, right? I'm like, I always tell people, Two abreast people, two abreast. But then, you know, by the time the whole dynamic happens and that happens several times, um, it, it gets, becomes very hard to, to maintain the, the law of two abreast. But it's always a risk that we take um, and we do tend to cycle, you know, I, I, I'm talking about the Pelotons, right? in a area where the speed limit is 35. So going 28, 25 is actually what everybody is basically riding their car. So there, it could be, it's a tricky question. We did have a question come in um, that's asked to also talk about critical mass rides. Is that, is that what you're talking about? 
No, a critical mass is a ride that happens every last Friday of the month okay. at um, major cities, right? Critical mass, the idea of critical mass was to actually promote safe cycling in a chaotic way. <laughs> Uh, the way that I even say safe cycling is critical mass was designed to be a civil disobedience you know, on the road. And this is where all the, the cyclists would come in. So I've done the critical mass in Miami, which is the biggest one here in South Florida with over 3000 bikers. Um, a lot of people didn't say these guys are, you know, chaotic, but what they did in Miami was um, they got in touch with the police departments and they plan out the route and they make it where the intersections are, will be you know, blocked off during the critical mass because there has to be like an awareness. And this is where you know, civil disobedience comes in play, I guess, a little bit. Uh, you know, bicycles belong on the road, not on the sidewalk. So that's what the critical mass is. Uh, there's, there's a, maybe they're, they're not using the, the correct term of critical mass, Maybe they're talking about the Pelotons, which is the racers. And then the critical mass is just regular bikes, uh, you know, beach cruisers on the road once a month, causing this civil disobedience to bring bicycle awareness into our streets. Okay. And how, how would we deal with mean drivers that think they're, that we are invading their space when we're on the road biking? Good question. <clears throat> Just like, you know, car weighs 6,000 pounds, I weigh, you know, 100 pounds, whatever. Um, you don't want to escalate any situation. Uh, we've, we've all seen what the escalation of any situation can become. So you always want to just, you're okay. You know, like mean drivers are mean drivers. They're always going to honk at us. They're always gonna try to push us off the road. Um, thankfully, you know, we have classes like this. We have uh, great bike shops around that are promoting cycling um, safely, but aggressive driver is an aggressive driver if you're on a bicycle or if you're on your car. So you, we've all had road rage seeing it on the road. And most of the times that road rage is not just against a, a cyclist, it's, it's against, a driver. So means people are always going to be mean. You know, we just like, you're on your bike, you're enjoying the sun, sunrise, sunset, the sun. Uh, I always say you can't find somebody without a smile on a bicycle. So just know that they're more miserable than you. <laughs> You'll be okay. <laughs> Never escalate anything. That is very true. All right, I have two more questions before we wrap up. Um, why are gloves important safety gear? Yeah, so gloves, um, same thing, gloves, helmets, are, you know, even knee pads sometimes, you know, when you're on the, on the road. Um, just like riding, driving your car with a seatbelt on. You don't want to use it, but if you do go down, most of the times you're going to get scrapes on your hands because that's the first thing you want. You want to, you know, hold yourself against the floor is your hands going to be the first ones hitting the ground. Um, I have, have uh, some knuckles over here, scratches uh, for me going down. Uh, this is even with gloves. So this is, you know, the gloves have some padding at the bottom. Uh, so you want that. That's a safety aspect but there's also a comfort aspect. You have your gel gloves. They eliminate some pressure points on your veins. So if you have right through there, you have some veins that actually have all the blood flow to your fingers. So if you, if you don't have gloves, if you don't take that stress out a little bit, um, you might get numbness on your hands. And if you have some gel gloves, it'll eliminate that. Uh, so it's the safety and comfort. Okay. And do you have any uh, like specific apps that are good for bike routes around here? So the, the only one app that I, I work with and do a lot is Strava. Um, there's uh, bike routes in there. 
Uh, it's a free downloadable app. If you have a ANT heart rate, you can connect it to it. Uh, if you have uh, like a speedometer on your bike, you can connect it to it. But if not, you don't have to. It like works through GPS with your phone. Um, and then there's segments of like speeds. If you want to start racing with some some friends, you can make your own group, and then you can make your own team, and then race between teams. Uh, Strava is is free. There's a pay version, and then there's not a paid version. But it's just like Facebook, where you're like you go in and you check out who rode today and how far and how fast and what's their route. So you and then they have achievements of so like over here the middle bridge, the north bridge. There's achievements of who goes up the bridge faster. You know the virtual uh, competition is always fun, right? Um, so who you know? Oh my gosh, I got I lost my first place uh, of of king of the king of the bridge. <laughs> so Strava would be the the app. Awesome. Okay. So I will also be sending out a, a follow-up email that I'll include details on that too. We had one other question. Are there any forms of bicycle awareness taught in the driver's license test? There should be. There should be. Um, that is a state's uh, advocacy that should be going on. Uh, they do have, I believe there's five questions in the safety test. That's not to say that all five would actually pop up on the test, uh, but one does pop up. Um, you know, just like a pedestrian question would pop up uh, on your test. Uh, I think they have a little bit more though, but you know, it, it's always aware, and this is where this class is amazing. Uh, we can publicly display it everywhere is, um, just bicycle safety should be in everybody's mind, right? But they don't have it specifically just geared like a whole section of questions for dedicated for bikers, bikers. Yeah, it definitely seems like that would be the logical thing to do so that we can all stay safe and it is considered a vehicle and we do have to follow the same, same laws and rules. Um, and yes, I do agree. We had another comment in the chat. There should be a mandatory bicycle safety test for drivers. Definitely agree on that. And hopefully, um, hopefully that's something that, um, you know, Juan, I don't know if that's something that we're able to advocate for or um, push for the state level. Yes. Uh, so Florida Bicycle Association is actually advocating for more of that. There is a license plate we can all get and it helps to share the road. And that's all part of the, um, the advocacy group as well, as well as there's other national companies, uh, People for Bikes, um, they go into the Senate and, you know, discuss with senators and House Republicans or House uh, members, uh, House representatives, and they do a really good, um, good job at it. Uh, People for Bikes is a national organization as well as there's an international organization well, actually, they, they go internationally too, but there's there's all these organizations that are pushing for it. Um, so like any donation works, if you get the license plate that goes to it, the, the state level, um, hopefully we'll, we'll be better, you know. I think it's going definitely in the right direction uh, now with, where we see that the bicycle is more than just a, a toy Right, and, and I've always said this, bicycles are not toys. <laughs> uh, there's actually, I'm a firm believer of the bicycle is the, and the solution for most of the world's most complicated problems. So, you know, we always say there's traffic. Well, get on a bike, you know. We can, we can fit as many people, you know, on the same lane um, with less congestion. So. There's, there's all these other aspects of, of advocating for bikes. Yes, and we are also with the city of West Palm Beach, you know, we're trying to, we have a mobility plan. We are trying to make our city more walkable and bikeable and safer for everyone to get out there and get out of your cars and enjoying um, just the outdoors because we, I, I think people are a little bit happier too um, when they're spending more time outside and outside of their car um, so that's definitely something that we're working on as a city, 
as well. And I see there's some other questions coming in. Oh, wait, no, it's just a thank you. But I'm going to just share my screen real quick because I want to I want to just wrap up here. Um, and thank you, Juan, for joining us today. Um, we're so appreciative that you have joined us and shared your knowledge. And um, I just want to go over, you know, if you do like spending time on a bike, maybe you have a garden, maybe you're spending some time outside around your home. We have rain barrel giveaways. Our next one is on January 9th. So if you are in the city of West Palm Beach, um, definitely visit our webpage, wpv.org slash save water. Um, and you can get a free 55 gallon rain barrel. We also have free tree giveaways too. So this is something that goes to walkability and mobility. Um, you know, just planting more trees is going to make our city cooler because sometimes, especially in the summer, I don't know about you guys, but it gets so hot that I don't, it, it's, it's hard for me to get excited about going outside when it's just so hot. So the more trees that we can plant, the cooler we're going to make our city. Um, not only is it going to be cool in like a fun way, because I feel like trees are kind of fun, but also just cool in a temperature way. So it'll make our city a little bit, um, it'll bring that temperature down. And also our next program is going to be on January 8th. We usually have one every Friday, but since we're getting into the holidays, our next one won't be until January 8th, but I hope you all will join us. The registration for this program will be in the follow-up email as well. So if you're interested, that information will be there for you. And this is the Office of Sustainability. This is our main webpage, wpv.org slash green. Like I mentioned in the beginning, we have a lot of other programs and information available on our webpage. So I do encourage you to to go on there and just kind of click around. And also we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as WPV Green. And I know Juan, you're on social media too with Upcycle. So I'll be sending out all of those details again in that follow-up email. So just a big thank you um, for everyone that has joined us today. And to Juan, again, we really appreciate you spending the time and being here with us and sharing all this important information. You have something else to add? <laughs> yeah, I think there's a last question there. Oh. Uh, is, is it legal to motor motorize a bicycle? Uh, yes. It's legal and also uh, electric bikes. They're, they're, they're the same as a bicycle, but just with power. Yeah. And do you, if you motorize a bicycle, is it more important to ride that on the road? Yes. Than on the side? Okay. Yeah. Definitely. So once you get uh, e-power or motor power, uh, you're definitely going to be going faster. And beyond just the safety aspect between pedestrians on the sidewalk, there's all these little humps of the little roads. So you start, you know, going that fast and it's just harder to, to maintain a more stable bicycle. So you go on the road and it's more of a flat surface, all these safety aspects that go along with the road. Uh, so definitely e-bikes or motorized um, right on the road. Now, hopefully you don't, you're not putting more than 49cc engine on these bicycles. Uh, but if you do, you definitely need to get a uh, driver's license with a motorist cycle, like a motorcycle uh, license. So you don't never want to put that big of an engine on a bicycle anyways, but. How fast do your e-bikes go? So the e-bikes have three categories. Uh, the class one is um, goes reaches to max 20 miles per hour and it shuts off after that. That's a uh, pedal assist only. So there is no throttle. So you pedal it and it assists you to go to 20 miles per hour, shuts off. There is class two, which is 20 miles per hour with the throttle and a pedal assist. So you can stop pedaling and with the throttle, you just continue going 20 miles per hour, it shuts off. Class three is the fastest. Uh, that shuts off at 28 or 29 miles per hour. It has the throttle sometimes, but it's mostly pedal assist. Uh, let me rephrase that. The throttle only goes to 20 miles per hour the pedal assist goes to 28 miles per hour. So those are the three classes of electric bicycles. 28 is pretty fast though, especially pretty on fast. a bike. <laughs> well, I, I thank you for everyone sticking around and you know, Juan answering all of our questions that we had today. 
Um, if you guys do have any questions, you know, I will include Juan's contact info in the follow up email and you'll have mine as well. So if you have any questions whatsoever, you know, we will definitely follow up with you. So just let us know. I hope you all have enjoyed today's presentation and I hope you have a great rest of your Friday, great holiday season, and hopefully we'll see you again next time. Thank you. Bye.